So welcome back, everyone. Um, we're on to our second uh, lecture. And this one is, um, as I say, these are our standard slides. Um, so Creative Commons, and then we're gonna be focusing on metabolite identification and annotation for the next uh, hour and a half about. So um, we're gonna be looking at the three main platforms uh, in metabolomics, NMR, GCMS, and LCMS. And I think from our little survey, we found that there's about five or six of you doing NMR, six or seven of you that do LCMS, and the vast majority of you will be doing our do LCMS. And then we're gonna learn about uh, some of the MS searches and databases, and that mostly relates to, to LCMS. Um, so let's dive into that now. Um, you saw these slides before, uh, which is this idea of annotation, um, whether it's NMR spectra or mass spectra, you have a bunch of peaks, you don't know what those peaks mean. And metabolite annotation is all about identifying those peaks. And it's either producing a picture like what's shown above uh, with labeled uh, peaks or a table uh, shown below, which has the names of the compounds and their concentrations or their relative intensities or relative concentrations. And obviously the idea is to have more than just one or two. You'd like to have dozens to hundreds, even uh, hopefully one day thousands where you can annotate. So if you compare metabolomics with things like genomics and proteomics, um, there have been, at least in genomics and proteomics, a long time, essentially web servers where you can take uh, a DNA sequence and go to something called BLAST, which some of you have heard about, and search uh, that sequence against a database of, of genomic sequences, um, which then can give you, uh, identify that gene for you. Um, it can also, you can use modifications of that to help get transcript abundance, those of you doing RNA-seq. It's the same sort of thing. If you do proteomics, uh, you can take uh, gel data or uh, LCMS, MS data, spectra that you've collected from your proteomics experiment and go to something called mascot or other tools and just type in all of your peak intensities, press go, and out comes the identified proteins. Uh, and then that can also be used to get your concentration data if, if you have intensity information. Historically, um, with metabolomics, it, it just, it wasn't that easy. You couldn't take your chromatogram, upload it to a website called Metaboblast or something, and it wouldn't come out and doesn't come out with your metabolite IDs. Uh, and it's still kind of difficult, but I think we're gonna show you some software over the next day or two that, that actually does do that relatively quickly now. But it historically has been a problem with metabolomics in that there just wasn't these web servers to do instant identification or instant quantification. Um, there's a quote that was from Donald Rumsfeld uh, back in, I guess about 2001, um, where he said, there are known unknowns, as to say, we know that there are some things that we do not know, but then there are also unknown unknowns, the ones that we don't know that we don't know. And then I think there are unknown, unknown knowns and known, unknown, unknowns. And it's gotten into be a, I guess, a bit of a, a meme, but um, we have a situation in metabolites, in metabolomics, where um, we can identify compounds that are, at the time they're just peaks, but they are knowable and known. Uh, they have reference spectra. They have a lot of information about them. And, and that's largely what we do in metabolomics, whether it's an untargeted or targeted metabolomics. Um, the unknown unknowns is, is a lot harder. This is where you have to do computer-aided structure elucidation, or you have to do a lot of synthetic work. Um, most people over the course of their lifetime may only identify one or two unknowns, unknown unknowns. Some of these may take uh, several years to identify. People who are natural product chemists do this a little more often. Um, but I can tell you as someone who's been doing, in meta doing metabolomics for 20 years, I have met to identify an unknown unknown. 
Uh, so the vast majority of our time is spent identifying known unknowns, things that are um, have references, but at the time that we collect our data, we just didn't know what they were. I hope that makes sense. So to, to identify known unknowns, we, we use basically spectral deconvolution. Uh, it's more commonly applied to NMR, but it's also deconvolution is done in GCMS, LCMS, MSMS. Um, spectral deconvolution is essentially taking uh, a spectrum of, of a mixture of compounds or peaks and to compare that mixture of peaks with um, peaks from pure compounds, reference compounds. And those reference compounds are in some kind of pre-compiled database. And there's a huge effort going on in the metabolomics community, the chemistry community, the natural products community to create reference databases that have um, pure spectra of well purified um, single compounds for NMR, GCMS, and LCMS, or MSMS. And doing specialty convolution allows you to quantify, and in many cases, not only uh, not identify, but also quantify. So in the case of NMR, this is an example, and this is one we'll start with. And this is actually how I got into metabolomics 20 years ago. I guess it's 22 years ago. Um, so I was dealing with a mixture of uh, compounds, and you can see a whole bunch of peaks at the top, that's in blue. Uh, you can see doublets and triplets and singlets. And what you have to do is have a reference set of known compounds. So compound A, B, and C, red, green, and purple, those have characteristic spectra. And so if you know a little bit about NMR, you know that um, in NMR, one compound does not equal one peak. Uh, one compound usually equals 10 or 12 peaks or something like that. So compound A is a couple of doublets, a triplet and a, and a doublet, a couple of singlets. Um, compound B, a couple of doublets, compound C. And you can see that in some cases, the doublets overlap. And so the net effect is that the actual mixture spectrum is the sum of these two. And it turns out in this spectrum that all three compounds are of equal concentration. So the intensities are, are reflected in that. And the height of the peaks is partly related to the number of hydrogen atoms or protons. But you can see how these red, green, and purple peaks add up to the blue peak. So we can go one way, which is adding them together. But the real challenge is the reverse. It's to go from the top spectrum and figure out that it's actually made of those three compounds and not four compounds and not five or not one. And so deconvolution is called an inverse problem and it's, it's a difficult problem to solve. In NMR, there's a software company that was started about 20 years ago, it's called Kenomics. And it was uh, back when the word metabolomics wasn't around. Um, so this was a kind of a made up name, but it does uh, spectral annotation um, for NMR. And what you can see is in the big screen is a, an NMR spectrum. Um, and what's also visible uh, in the lower corner is the full spectrum ranging from zero to 10 ppm. There's a water peak there. This is looking around 3.73 to 3.82 ppm. The lines here correspond to the spectrum. Um, and then inside you can see this quartet that fits very nicely to part some of the peaks in the spectrum. What's shown in the table are the peaks that have been identified in the compounds and their concentrations. So this software is, is deconvoluting the NMR spectrum. It's allowing you to identify, in this case, the alanine peak. And there's the 3.8 ppm, that's for alanine. And it's given us the concentration as well. Um, so in an NMR, um, what the Kenomics software does, it's, it's commercial software. Um, you process the NMR spectrum manually, and then you phase it. You remove the water signal. You do what's called baseline correction in NMR to flatten out the signal. You manually reference things. You normalize the peak shapes so they're symmetric. 
And then you fit the spectra to a library of about 400 spectra using kind of a guess and check. Um, you say, well, this kind of looks like it could be alanine or I know alanine is supposed to be here. You click on the alanine signal and it up it pops and you find that it's a little bit off. And so you use your mouse to drag and shift it until it actually lines up. So you do that over and over again as you analyze the spectrum. And a, a person who's trained in this can take about 20 to 30 minutes to finish a spectrum. Someone who's never done it, as we've tried a few times with people, takes about two hours, three hours to fit a single spectrum um, in a mixture, say, of blood. And different people have different ways of baseline correction, different ways of doing their chemical shift referencing and phasing. So it means that it, it is prone to error. So it's slow and prone to error is a, is a bit of a problem. But this is one of the very first um, metabolomic software tools to come out. As I say, it's almost 20 years old. Brooker has developed software called Amix, which does something similar to what the Konomics software does. They've also developed with NMR instruments called the juice screener and the wine screener. And they also have none now for uh, spectral analysis of um, uh, LDL, HDL lipoproteins. Um, but this is an automatic tool for analyzing juice components and wine components. Um, Imperial College has come up with a tool called Batman, which does automatic analysis of NMR spectra. And then uh, my group has been working on two other ones. One's called Basil, which we'll learn about today, and another one called Magmet, Magnetic Metabolomics or Mag Magnetic NMR Metabolomics. So both of these are automatic tools for doing spectral deconvolution, do all the things that you do with Konomics, but trying to automate it. So when you automate things, obviously it's fast. The computers can just work night and day, but they work faster than you do. Uh, it means that their precision, sensitivity, recall is really high. So there's no variation between one person and another. The computer makes the same mistakes, but also does it the same way means you can run it all the time. People don't get tired at dragging and clicking and dropping. Um, you don't have user bias or user errors. And it uh, turns out that computers can sometimes detect things that humans can't. Um, sometimes we have our own biases. Sometimes our eyes aren't as good as we thought they were. So NMR uh, is technically the only fully automated approach to doing metabolomics now. Um, thanks to some of the software like Batman or Fruit Juice Screener or Basil. And so we want to introduce this to you as part of the course, in part to highlight the fact that there are techniques that can fully automate metabolomics. And groups that are doing automated NMR-based metabolomics are able to analyze um, tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of samples. So if, if throughput is something that you need to do, um, NMR currently is, is the best approach to do that. Of course, it's not as sensitive and you need a fair bit of sample volume. But right now, a company called Nightingale based in Finland is analyzing all the samples in the UK biobank using NMR-based metabolomics. Um, Batman is, as I said, a software tool, an open source project um, that was developed uh, by Tim Ebbels in um, Imperial College, and it, it uses uh, Bayesian deconvolution uh, to identify metabolites in one-dimensional spectra. The first publications came in 2012, and they haven't really done a whole lot of development since 2015 about. Um, the difficulty with Batman was that most of the data processing uh, has to be done manually, and, and that actually takes most of the time. Um, so you still have to do baseline correction and referencing and phasing, and that varies a lot from person to person. So what we decided um, to do was to try and develop something that was fully automated, something that would do um, all of the phasing, chemical shift referencing, water removal, baseline correction, component identification, compound quantification all at once. That was harder than we thought, but it's been running now for about five or six years and it works pretty well. So it's now been converted to a web tool and this is what you guys will use. Um, it's very accurate. It uses um, something similar to hidden Markov models. Uh, some of you might know or have heard of that, but hidden Markov models are 
a form of probabilistic graphical modeling, and they're used in speech recognition. So if you used Siri or Alexa, or Amazon, or Google Home, those use hidden Markov models to determine your speech and recognize voice patterns. Um, we treat the NMR spectrum kind of like a, a speech or voice pattern. Um, it ends up fitting peaks and shifting intensities um, the way that people sort of do. It has to know something, just like you know Siri know, has to know that you're speaking English. Um, if it thinks if you're speaking to it in Chinese, it won't do very well. So if you tell Basil that I'm looking at serum as opposed to looking at urine, or I'm looking at a plant extract, then it has an idea of what, what compounds it should typically find. Um, but that's not a whole lot of additional information. And so it does a lot of the, the work computationally. This is an example of the fitting that, that Basil does, um, where in one case we're looking at a spectrum where there's 90 compounds. And you can see the, the blue green line is what the actual spectrum is. And then all those colored peaks below, that's the fitting. And so if you're trying to do that by hand, um, it would take a long time. It would be very hard to do. Um, and you can do it for 150 compounds and that's also shown below. So this is the, the strength or the advantage of doing um, uh, automatic deconvolution. A computer doesn't get tired, you do. A computer can kind of see patterns where you can't. Um, and that's, again, the strength of automated deconvolution. Here's an example where we're comparing basal versus manual. So this is someone who spent about 45 minutes fitting the spectrum. You can see the black is the actual spectrum, the red is the fit. And so they used Konomics and they clicked and dragged, clicked and dragged and shifted. Then below is basal and it's again, the red versus black. And you can look very closely and you can see the fits are almost identical. Um, in some cases, there might be some things where it's a little better. Um, but the point was that this was done by the computer. You could refit it again and again and again and get exactly the same answer. If you ask the same person to analyze the same spectrum, uh, they'd probably get a different answer every single time. And of course, the computer can do this over and over, and you can run it on multiple processors. So that makes it very, very fast. So Basil, as I said, is converted to a website. Um, the bays, uh, basil is obviously a plant, but basil spelled this way is about uh, a, a nod of the head to Bayesian statistics, which are used a little bit in the program. <laughs> um, so it's a website, uh, it's been written up, uh, it's been used by a lot of people. Um, it has a very strict protocol about how you need to run things. Um, unfortunately, a lot of people never read that. Um, so. Um, a lot of people are trying to fit NMR in an inappropriate way, but that's life. Um, so how does Basil work? So typically you start um, with um, um, a screen like this. You choose a file or you upload your spectrum. So this is like this idea that we had with uh, the, the blast for metabolomics. So upload your spectrum. Uh, you can kind of provide a name. Um, so my spectrum, if you want to call it that. You tell it whether it's um, plasma or serum or cerebral spinal fluid. You tell it what uh, type of NMR instrument you're working with, uh, 500, 600, 700, 800. This is the measure of the frequency or the size of the magnet. And then you indicate um, how much of this chemical shift referencing compound called DSS uh, has been added. And then you can tell it whether you want the fast or the slow, slow poke approach. Uh, once you've filled in those things, then you can click go. And in the first five seconds, it takes the NMR spectrum and does a Fourier transform. And so this is what an NMR spectrum looks like first time it's transformed. So that's pretty ugly. Lots of peaks that are pointing up and down. Next thing it does is it phases the spectrum. So that's getting all the peaks so they're pointing up. And so it looks a little more reasonable like a real NMR spectrum, but you can also see that the baseline isn't great and there's a giant water peak. So that phasing takes about 15 seconds. Then it does the uh, removal of the water, does the baseline correction, and then it figures out where the zero PPM or DSS signal is. And so in about 30 seconds, it has done all of the automatic processing. Uh, and this is about three to five times faster than what a human can do. 
but it does this automatically and it'll do it consistently. And baseline correction is something it, that varies a lot from person to person. It's a little bit like art. So at that point, it then does an automatic fitting and that will take the three to four minutes after the pre-processing. So what you can see in this spectrum is you can see something that's black and you can see something that's blue. Black is the actual spectrum, blue is the fitted spectrum. And if you could you know, zoom in really close, you'll find that it matches essentially exactly. You see a giant peak at zero, that's the reference compound that's called DSS. And then you can see a few other peaks in the middle there and those are sugars and amino acids and a few other things. Um, it may look like it's fairly sparse. If you zoom down, you'll actually see many, many hundreds of peaks and all of those have been fit. And there are various tools that the software has. As it did the fitting, it was also determining the structure, determining the compound. And it also determines the concentration and it determines how confident it is. So in this particular sample, it could see uh, hydroxybutyrate, acetic acid, betaine, uh, carnitine, and it's measured the concentrations in micromolar. The accuracy that would you get in terms of concentration measurements with basal or magmet is about three to 4% uh, error, uh, which is actually four or five times better than what you get with mass spec. So this is an advantage of NMR in that it is very accurate for quantification and very reproducible. The confidence score ranges from zero to 10. And so many of them have a score of 10. Some aren't uh, as high. Um, and in some cases it's identified specifically that there is no material there. And so it's confident it is not in that sample. So the basal server that you guys will work with or learn about today uh, is limited to three types of biofluids, serum, plasma, and cerebrospinal fluid. Uh, magmet, which we were hoping to show this year, but not, uh, it's not quite ready, um, can work for um, a larger number of biofluids, including fecal water, and we're adjusting it to work for beer or wine. Um, NMR struggles to analyze urine. Uh, urine is very complicated, and so um, neither magmet nor basal handle urine. Uh, Basal is limited to NMR instruments that are 500 or 600 megahertz. It can handle like, data from different manufacturers as well. Um, as I said, you have to follow a protocol. So you need to filter your sample through a three kilodalton filter. You have to add DSS. You can't add TSP. Um, you have to add a referencing compound. Um, and um, I think the tendency is that people almost never read the instructions. So it makes it... Um, perform not as well as it's supposed to. It takes about five minutes and it analyzes a single spectrum at a time. So you guys will have a chance to, to run um, basal in the lab today. Uh, we'll give you some example spectra and you'll be able to sort of click and, and play around with it. We've designed it as a web-based tool um, and the version you have will actually allow you to analyze multiple um, uh, spectra at the same time. Now, switching to GCMS, um, this is obviously you know, changing gears quite a bit. Um, GCMS spectra look a little bit like NMR spectra. Um, they're peaks, they're narrow. Uh, instead of chemical shifts, you see retention times or retention indices. Under a given peak, um, sometimes there are actually two or three or four compounds, uh, which is sort of shown below. And the spectral deconvolution that's done in GCMS is more about trying to pick out those individual compounds under that single peak. Now in GCMS, you have the retention time chromatographic um, spectrum, but you also have the MS spectrum. So in the third dimension are these MS spectra or technically um, fragment spectra. So in GCMS, you use electro electron impact. So you fragment things into tiny fragments. Um, you might see the parent ion, sometimes you don't see the parent ion, but then you'll see all these fragments. And the fragments have a lot of information in them. So by using information about the it retention index, the COVATS retention index, as well as the actual peaks um, in these different spectra and the different colored ones, you know, turquoise, red, and blue, correspond to the three different spectra for the three different compounds that are under this one particular peak. We compare those peaks 
to a database. Um, and we look to see which ones match. And where we get matches, you can see where they're circled. And those matches that tell us essentially what the compound is because those, those are reference spectra. They were collected and they're stored in a computer. And the match tells us with pretty high confidence what they are. So in GCMS, you use electron ionization or electron impact. You get multiple peaks and those peaks are partially predictable, um, not entirely, but um, they, they make sense to um, skilled mass spectroscopists. Um, and so if you see this particular characteristic of 32, 31, 29, 15, um, that probably tells you that this molecule is methanol. So you can see in a, in a mass spectrum, uh, this is probably more like an MS, MS spectrum, but um, you can see whether it's in chemical ionization or electron impact or uh, ESI, you will see the molecular ion. Sometimes you'll get what are called adducts. These might include, um, in the case of um, GCMS, it could include the reagent gas. That's why you generally want to use helium so it doesn't get an adduct. But sometimes things just form these adducts. And then you get the fragments. And these are the smaller molecular weight um, ions uh, that are further to the left. So the mass or the M over Z starts at zero on the left and goes up to about 600 um, for most GCMS spectra. Now, we talked a little bit about how GCMS is done. Um, there are different derivatization reagents, which will react for specific things like ketones, methoxamine. It's used a lot for sugars. Um, TMS or TBDMS or BSTFA. These are molecules that attach trimethylsilane or variations of trimethylsilane. Uh, in this case, it's a, a methyl silyl group. And they usually react with hydroxyl groups or amino groups. And um, these derivatization reactions, uh, you have to do them separately. They take about an hour, things have to be heated. Um, and uh, they will produce or add different numbers of TMS or methoxines, depending on how many hydroxyl amino or ketone groups there are. So the net result is that sometimes you will have a compound that isn't derivatized. That compound may be derivatized uh, once or twice or three times because uh, there happen to be one, two, or three hydroxyl groups or one, two, or three amino groups. So from one compound, you can actually end up generating five, six, seven derivatized compounds or combinations of those. So that makes it a little confusing. Um, so if you were trying to look at a mixture of 100 compounds, now you've essentially got 600 compounds. Um, but that is the characteristic of uh, GCMS. It's widely used for identifying and quantifying uh, amino acids, organic acids, sugars, and fatty acids. It's limited to molecular weights of 500 or 600 Daltons. So that it doesn't cover the big molecules. It doesn't cover lipids or some of the larger metabolites. Um, the gas chromatography we've mentioned before is much better than liquid chromatography for resolution. The other thing about GCMS and EIMS is much more standardized. So this is just the fact that people were smart about it and standardized things. Uh, and this has essentially made GCMS um, almost automatable. Uh, and we're going to show you uh, a tool that, that almost makes uh, GCMS automatic, just like NMR. Um, there's a database, uh, the NIST database that many people use, and a software tool called AMDIS that is frequently used for um, GCMS. NIST, the National Institute of Standards, uh, which is based in um, DC, Washington, has just released the 2020 data MS database. Um, it includes a lot of compound data. And if you guys are doing metabolomics, I would certainly recommend uh, this database. It has a lot of ionization EI data, 300,000 compounds. It also has data from ion trap, triple cod, and QTOF. It also has lots of retention indices and retention times for compounds. 
Um, so it's an, an extensive comprehensive database that's, that's very well maintained. It has software called AMDIS, and this is what it looks like. It's a fairly primitive user interface. They haven't modernized it in 15 years, but it allows you to compare uh, what are called mirror spectra uh, between the predicted or the observed and the base and the database spectrum. And when you see matches like this in terms of the peaks and their intensities, you can be pretty confident that you found the right compound. So this is decobenzene or decilbenzene that's been identified. <coughs> um, so this is the spectral matching, and this is sort of the software that you can use in um, GCMS. AMDIS, which is bundled in the NIST uh, AMDIS software, stands for Automated Mass Spectral Deconvolution. You hear that word, deconvolution, and identification system. So just like NMR spectra, GCMS spectra has some noise. So it does some noise analysis, it clears things up. It does its own peak picking. Uh, this is always a challenge in mass spectrometry. And then it creates a model spectrum based on those peaks. And from that model spectrum, it does some of that deconvolution saying, is there one compound here or are there two compounds here? Are there three compounds here? So it decides whether there's one, two, or three and, and, and separates those out, and then it compares those spectra to the library using a thing called a match factor. So the match factor is just basically a way of measuring uh, the similarity. It's a dot product, if you've heard about linear algebra or a cosine score, A dot B equals AB cos theta. Um, this is essentially matching the intensity of the actual experimental or query spectrum with the reference of the um, um, database spectrum and it compares the mass um, for those those two and then there's a weighting score and they multiply so it produces a value between you know zero and one and they multiply it by a thousand so a perfect match factor is a thousand pretty good match factor is about 700 uh, and a lot of people will say they found a match if they get something between or anything about 600. If you're doing GCMS, um, you generally have to run a set of alkane standards. There's eight, nine, 10 of them, uh, ranging from eight carbon eights to 16 carbons. And that is used as a calibration set uh, to determine your retention indices. Uh, but it also can be used to help uh, some of the quantification. You run a blank sample in GCMS, and that's to um, sort of sort out the contaminants. So there's usually a solvent, some derivatization agents. So that's used to sort of help clean up or denoise your spectra. And then you run your sample of interest or samples uh, exactly the same way you ran under blank. And because GCMS is so reproducible, you really don't have to worry about too much drift at all. So this is what your alkane standards will look like. Um, there's two, four, six, eight, nine of them here. And you can see there are different retention times, you know, from two minutes up to about 10 minutes in this run. Um, and you can see that octane, non -ane, eight, nine, 10, 11 carbons, they are roughly spaced by about the same, same distance. So you're gonna be using a software tool called GC AutoFit, but you could also use the same thing for the AMDIS one. Once you have created a calibration file using the alkane standards, then you can determine from your retention time, you can determine the retention indices, the COVATS retention indices. And um, by calibrating and adjusting your retention indices, then you can use that information. Now the NIST database has the retention indices and it has the mass spectra. And so you can use that information to identify your compounds. Uh, you can also try and get rid of any of the false positives by comparing your spectra uh, to the blank. So in this regard, using the AMDIS system, it's, it's manual, um, but of course you've got tools that help facilitate that. So you saw the calibration standard uh, that we ran. Um, we upload that into AMDIS and there's some various windows to, to do that. I'm not gonna go into detail about it, but this is um, a similar thing that you would do in, in GC AutoFit. 
After you've uploaded the calibration one, then you tell it to calibrate uh, using the calibration file. So this will adjust everything um, so that the uh, retention time and retention indices are properly scaled. And this helps obviously with compound identification. Uh, so that's the equivalent in NMR, it's like chemical shift referencing, but it's just adjusting your retention times. And at this stage, you can actually start using the, the manual tools to, to, to do the spectral deconvolution. Um, so what you can see is that there's this white peak that we've highlighted uh, with the little red box. Um, and we can see the white peak expanded out here. And inside the white peak, um, there is a, a red peak and then there's a blue and a yellow peak below that. Um, and um, what's being identified as well from these peaks also corresponds to uh, the, the mass or the mass spectrum with this particular um, compound. So by clicking on any of these, we can see some of the peaks. So in this case, um, we're seeing a spectrum where there's something at 73, 59 and 172. And this is for the compound or compounds coming off at 11.597 minutes for the retention index. Um, so again, we're, we're looking at this again from this zoomed in perspective where we've selected this peak now at 19.5 minutes, I guess. Um, and we see the, the white peak, the blue, the red, the yellow. The yellow is, is not terribly important. Um, but when we look at the spectrum, um, corresponding mostly to the, the red and the blue, so this is actually the same compound, um, we see this spectrum. It's the same. And so we see a, a fragment ion at 73 and a parent ion at 144. And then we can compare the reference spectrum which is in, a, in the NIST database. And you can see an exact match, the 144 and the 73 in terms of their intensity. Uh, we can also see fragments of 59 and 100. And so a match factor is calculated. We don't show it here, but um, 600 out of 1,000 or 60% is the threshold typically to say this is a match. This one probably has a match factor close to 900. So we've shown you how you would do an analysis very briefly with GCMS using the AMDIS software uh, and the NIST um, resources, uh, but it's still a very manual process. And so we've been working uh, on trying to make this automatic, automatic. So this tool called GC AutoFit has been developed. There are other tools you can get from different manufacturers, uh, Chromatoff, Analyzer Pro, AMDIS, these are compared. There hasn't been much change except just in the size of the databases. Uh, there are other types of, of, of GCMS databases. Uh, there's a GOLM database maintained in Germany, mostly focused on plants. And Oliver Fien has developed his own library that he sells through Lico and Agilent. Uh, these are not quite as large as the NIST ones, but they are alternatives. So as I said, the, the AMDIS one is a manual one. It's kind of like the equivalent of the Konomics software. Uh, you do have to pay money for the NIST databases, just like you have to pay money for the Konomics software. Uh, so we wanted to try and develop something that was free and open access. And so this is what we've come up with. And so it's called GC AutoFit. And just like AMDIS, it requires you provide it with alkane standards. You have to provide it with a blank GCMS spectrum, and then you have to provide it with your sample or samples. Just like AMDIS, uh, except more automatically, it does automatic alignment. It does peak identification. It calculates peak intensity and reference concentrations. And so it'll do the compound identification and concentration work. It accepts a variety of files. It's actually faster than, than uh, Basil. And it's slightly more accurate, actually. And it's been um, optimized to work with a bunch of fluids. It works quite well with urine, whereas NMR can't. It can also work with blood and saliva. Now, the disadvantage with GCMS is you have to do 
sample workup. You have to do derivatizations. You have to do a little bit of chemistry. Um, so unlike NMR, where you can just take your sample and immediately drop it in, um, you still have to do this extra uh, chemical work. So in that regard, GCMS is not as automated as NMR. Um, there's still a lot of manual workout. So for GC AutoFit, you have to put up or upload some files, um, the Elkane standards um, in a format called MZXML, a blank sample um, that's labeled the same way, and then your sample files. Um, there's a standard set, um, a converting software, and Proteo Wizard is probably the most popular uh, for converting all the different file formats that every vendor produces. Um, so um, that's, that's critical for being able to analyze the software. Um, GC AutoFit has a similar interface to, to Bazel. Um, you upload your files. You can upload them one at a time. You can upload your Alkane standards, your blanks, and your samples. So you click on Browse. Um, and you have the choice, as I say, from one at a time to zipped files. Um, to be able to, to do the identification and quantification, you do need a library. Um, and so this comes with its own library for urine and serum and saliva. Um, and so certainly we recommend that people use the, the library that it has, but it also means that you'd have to run the spectra in a, in a way that's very similar to what we, we run in our lab. Um, but that's pretty standard. Um, so the standards, this is the alkane standard, um, and these are the sample spectrum, and this is the, the blank spectrum. So you can see the alkane standards with about 15 peaks. Uh, here's the blank where there's some derivatives and the solvent peaks that you're in there. And then here's the actual sample spectrum. You can see a bunch of, at least the chromatogram and the, um, base peak chromatogram. Um, so once those things are uploaded, then the computer does the magic. And what it proceeds to do is produce a list not unlike what you saw with Basil. Um, it identifies the compound, there's the name, here's the retention time, uh, here's the quality of the fit, um, the intensity, uh, the level of match factor area, the actual concentrations. So some compounds are identified, some aren't, but here's your concentration information. And then you can, um, just like with basal, you can see the spectrum, but now the peaks are labeled. So it's not a case where you're fitting uh, like you are with NMR. It's just, it's now doing the labeling. So it, this mostly is there to tell you it's done it. This is really where the, the meat of the GC auto fit results are. So you can then download the results into an Excel or CSV compatible format, and then it, um, gives you both the compound identifier, uh, HMDB identifier, and then you can also um, go through and look at the spectrum if, if you like, or if you need to have that for um, publication purposes. Um, I'm gonna stop here. So I've, I've gone through NMR and GCMS. Um, are there any questions that people have? Um, or are, am I coming out clearly or is it a little confusing? Um, I just have a question. Um, so I work with waterfowl, so birds, and I'm looking to do fecal metabolomics. And the thing with that is that they have excreta, so it's both feces and they have the urates in there as well. Yeah. Um, we were hoping to run NMR, yeah. like freeze dry them and run M NMR. Would I be able to use your basal software with that if it does contain any urates in it? No, uh, you probably wouldn't. Um, okay. The thing is that uh, the duck or bird excreta will be have quite a few different compounds. Um, yeah. uh, you, could, you could run, if you're looking at the duck serum, you could probably run it because uh, it turns out serum is between animals and birds is very similar. Yeah. Um, 
but yeah, uh, the excreta is highly variable. Um, as I say, we're doing one for human excreta or feces with, with magmet. Yeah. But even going from infants to adults, there's quite a change. And then even from diet. So it's, it's not simple. And of course, humans have a very different diet than ducks. And as you say, yeah. um, birds include essentially the equivalent of both urine and feces together. So it's going to be pretty complicated. Um, and so the NMR, you would, you'd have to use this, this canomics approach or the manual approach um, if you wanted to do it by NMR. Um, I mean, we can certainly help with that if you, if you wanted uh, some advice. I'd have to do it offline, but Metabolomics Innovation Center does quite a bit of exotic samples and they have a lot of um, tricks to, to help with that. Okay, thanks. Um, <clears throat> so any other questions? All right, so I assume everyone's following me. So I'm gonna dive into sort of MS now and uh, this will be a, the bulk of the talk. Um, but it, it refers to essentially how we identify compounds in MS. And this is sort of the Metabolo Metabolomics Society MSI, Metabolite Standards Initiative. And they have four levels right now, although they're adjusting it. Um, and to sort of level one, level two, level three, level four. Level one are compounds that have been positively identified and they're confirmed by a match to a known standard. Um, unless you have a large library of standards in your lab, most people don't le reach level one. What most people get to is a level two, which is a, still called putatively identified where they match to a reference spectrum that they have in a library, uh, whether it's in Metlin or HMDB or Mona or whatever, uh, for GCMS, it might be retention time, um, but it's still considered a putative match. And so unless you actually synthesize or buy the actual standard and demonstrate you get exactly the same result on exactly the same machine, you haven't reached level one. Level three is uh, compounds identified uh, as a compound class, it still can be a named compound, but it might be that you're just identifying only by the mass to charge. And so usually there's multiple um, possible isomers. Um, you can also use other techniques like classifier to help identify them. Um, and then the last one is saying it's a peak and I don't know what it is. And for untargeted metabolomics, that's what you have for about 95% of your peaks. Um, so it's important to remember these, but also I'll be bringing this up a few more times as we move on. So if we go to LCMS, metabolite identification, looks a lot like GCMS. Instead of a GC chromatogram, we have an LC chromatogram. Uh, we still have peaks that are under, uh, you know, sometimes uh, several peaks. Uh, we have either a, a single MS um, spectrum, which might just be the parent ion, or we have the MSMS spectrum which look a lot like GCMS spectra. And then you have your library and you try and do your matching. So same concepts can be applied just as we did for AMDIS and the NIST database to uh, LCMS uh, metabolite identification. Now you also can look at LCMS spectra in this three dimensional view where you have um, the mass to charge, retention time, and then the peak intensity. Um, and in the case of we've seen before with GCMS, a single compound can generate multiple fragments. So you have your adducts, things that are sodium or potassium or if they're negative ion mode, chlorine uh, adducts. You might get um, paired ions. So there might be two molecules uh, bundled together. So doubly charged and singly charged and triply charged. Uh, In-source fragments. Uh, that happen just through the ionization. And then you'll get other peaks from the, coming from the carbon-13, deuterium-15, nitrogen 15, chlorine variants. So the, the resulting 3D spectrum um, is complicated. I've shown you examples of it. This is a, a more realistic one. Um, in terms of um, what you're challenged to do is to work with those 3D plots, and then this is graphed in the 2D plot, so you can look at the extracted ion chromatogram slices and see the retention time and see the charge and see the intensity. 
Um, so just as with AMDIS, you have to do peak identification. Um, and you have to try and identify those signals that correspond to individual compound ions. What you're trying to go from is something that might be multiple peaks down to a single peak, a single unique mass to charge, and a single retention time. So from many to one, or from, in the case of complex spectra, uh, tens of thousands of features to a few thousand features. So, uh, retention time matching is something we've already talked about. We talked about the cow method. Um, we talked about um, the XCMS methods, some of the others. So this is how you can align retention times as you go from sample to sample uh, or for batch to batch. Um, so that helps reduce the number of peaks. Uh, so retention and peak matching and retention time correction can be done this way. Um, you can also think of it in more in a mathematical way. And this is something that's been developed really nicely in Metaboanalyst 3 uh, to really improve uh, peak selection in LCMS data. So the first thing you do is try and do uh, peak matching across retention time, and then you do the retention time correction. So that's where the sort of visually is being done. Then you redo your alignment and update those groups. Um, so you're trying to match again both the ions, retention time, and then you iterate and you repeat that process over and over. And that iteration process of matching retention time and peaks, mass peaks, um, really helps clean up the peak identifications or simplification. So let's imagine we start with these three samples, um, three runs, uh, presumably of mostly the same material. Let's say it's blood or serum. You have a mass to charge, you have a retention time, you have an intensity. So you can see the mass to charge is a 389, a 389, a 389, same retention time, and all it's varying is just the, the intensity. Um, so, okay, that's just a different concentration. Uh, but here we get something that has 126. Here's another one, another one that has a 102 instead of a 126, but it's exactly the same retention time. So that might be an adduct. Uh, and then here's another 126, also very close to the similar retention time. Um, here's another one, uh, which is 102, and also has a similar retention time similar to this. So you can kind of see some similarities in these samples. So let's, you know, as we're sort of converting this simple 3D value, we've colored them. Um, and we've marked the ones that match very nicely in yellow. Uh, the green ones also match in terms of mass and retention time. And the pink ones match in terms of mass and retention time. And then the cyan or blue ones also are somewhat different. So we've, we've been able to do a, a grouping uh, by mass to charge. And then um, we can now group by the retention time. So in this case, we're sorting things out. Uh, here they are grouped by retention time in the yellow. Um, here they are, 51, 51.9, 51.9, and 52. So the green and the pink nicely match according to retention time. The purple is a sort of an outlier, and the blue is also an outlier. Um, so now that we've done that, uh, matching and we iterate, and we can reiterate, uh, getting these pinks and purples and blues and greens. The final result is this, where we now have a total of um, five retention or five mass to charges, um, a grouping of, according to retention time, and then um, where they are in the samples. And so by, by creating this table and having done this iteration, uh, it's possible to firm up which peaks are real, which ones aren't, which ones are addicts, which ones aren't, um, and which ones should be bundled or grouped together to reduce the initial set of what seems like tens of thousands of peaks to a smaller number of peaks. So LCMS for untargeted metabolomics is possible through using a whole range of commercial programs. And a lot of companies invest quite a bit of money and sell these tools like the Mass Hunter, Brooker's Profile Analysis, Sev, Progenesis QI. There's always ones that are coming up and I've just kind of 
given up trying to, to chase down all the different ones. I'm sure all of you have used, or some of you have used these commercial ones, but what we wanna focus in on is the free options. And this is one of the mandates for CBW is to, to make people aware of the free software. So some of you have mentioned MS Dial, some of you have used MZ or MZ Mine, uh, MZ, MZ Mine 2. Uh, a lot of you have used XCMS, I'm sure, or used XCMS online. We're also gonna be introducing you to Metabo Analyst R. So the ones in red are the ones that we're gonna to highlight today. So XCMS is, is very well known, widely used. Uh, we'll probably take a little survey at the end of the lecture just to find out how many have used it. Uh, Gary Shustak developed it in 2006. Um, it does peak picking, peak matching, retention time alignment. Uh, it does batch processing and accepts a whole range of different formats uh, from a whole bunch of different instruments. Uh, a survey was done and it's actually the most used metabolomics uh, MS processing tool. Um, now, the challenges with using the XCMS package is that it is an R program. It's something that you download. And so if you know R uh, and have written in R, it's probably something you're comfortable with. Not everyone here knows R and not everyone's a programmer. There's also a huge number of parameters and it uses a whole bunch of different programs and subprograms written by different people. And if you just sort of use the default stuff, you actually don't do very well. Um, so there's a lot of learning uh, and tutorials. Um, if you're processing uh, untargeted LCMS data, the data files are huge. Um, and so you have to have a big computer, lots of RAM. Um, so because of the problems with um, the offline XCMS, they've created the online version, a web version for XCMS. Uh, this is what it looks like, and this is a web server, or web address. Um, you have to get a, um, a password or an account with it, uh, but once you've got your password, then you can get onto XCMS. So it does everything that XCMS does. It does the alignment, it does the scaling and peak picking. Uh, does, it also goes further and can do data reduction and feature selection via PCA and PLSDA. So it does some of the things that Metabo Analyst does as well. It does metabolite identification. It does M over Z and Z matches. Uh, you can also do MS, MS spectral matching. And it uses its own database called the Metlin database. Now, when you're doing untargeted LCMS, MS, you are not quantifying. So all you can do is get some relative value. Um, so, you know, 786, that's all it is, it's 786. It's not micromolar, millimolar, it's just 786. That's the intensity. And so if you see something that's 886, um, yes, the intensity is higher, but you can't confidently say that the concentration is more. That's just the intensity. Um, so that's a caution I think people need to be aware of uh, when they do metabolomics with an untargeted approach. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm going to uh, present next uh, about 20 slides on uh, LCMS, especially using Metabo Analyst R. So compared to uh, GC and NMR, LCMS is not so standardized. So there's a lot of a lot of uh, issues, uh, process and raw spectra. And uh, yes, David mentioned about uh, using standard reference will help a lot, but a lot of times, and it spectra collected, and there's no, no, not so much uh, uh, reference things going on. So if you really want to compare, is that you compare the same compounds or same peaks across uh, different samples. So assuming that the same compounds, if they have the iron suppression will be applied to this because the same structure will be, have a similar effect. You cannot compare the, uh, the intensity across different compounds, especially they have a very different structure and you need absolute quantification for, for that purpose. But for the same peaks across different replicates, that's relatively safe. So that's what I would like to say, because this is one we're going to use the peak intensity table to do like some statistical analysis. So at least uh, the same compounds, uh, that's, it's more or less comparable. That's, uh, I will just uh, follow up on the question. So um, for the LCMS and uh, my group, uh, and so in, since actually, since uh, about 10 years ago, I, I started using uh, XCMS to do the um, spectral processing. 
and it's a uh, it's the first um, uh, open source tools and it's uh, very powerful but there's a lot of issues so um uh, the previous uh, slides already mentioned and uh, it's very powerful have many steps and uh, um you need you can upload your data and uh, um, doing all the pick pick and pick alignment and, uh, and doing statistical analysis but there's other issues like um uh, parameter so parameter default parameter doesn't work well we the more we try the more we realize we cannot use default parameter we need to specify the parameters or make it better it's a, have a huge impact on downstream also for lcms it's quite used for large scale studies and they use auto sample stuff so the batch effect is very important so you also need to do the batch effect correction so lcms spectral processing is very challenging it's a really a big data issue and here the the the, the pipeline just showing some commonly used tools uh, in uh, XCMS is the main thing, but uh, from there you use a package called IPO to do the parameter of the optimization. And then after the optimized parameter, you run XMS, then you're doing a batch correction. And finally, you're doing this using RAM class R to export data and to do the uh, data statistics analysis. So it's very um, complicated pro uh, process and you need a powerful server to do that. It probably takes several days or several weeks so uh, that's that's really uh, motivate us to can we make, do a better job here because it's a huge bottleneck. So uh, we here we discuss about Metabo Analyst R. We uh, we we have a web based tool Metabo Analyst to do mainly statistical data analysis, doing some functional analysis for targeted uh, metabolomics data. And uh, if we um, want to do raw data processing, how can we um, just do it? We're starting with the R package, so uh, based on the uh, uh, XMS as initially doing a peak picking and a peak annotation based on the uh, uh, um, camera package, and we do some cleaning and we do the statistical analysis and uh, uh, that uh, knowledge based an analysis uh, tool called MamiChalk, and we will we can try today and most likely we'll introduce more tomorrow. How do we do in the uh, Functional analysis direct from LCMS picks. So this is the main uh, flow I shared before. But uh, the issue with this is um, the parameter optimization and uh, and how do we do it? There's about uh, 15 or 16 parameters, and nobody can this try and error. Which one works best? It's really really hard to to do it. If we use the IPO package, which is uh, very well established, it uh, takes about uh, several weeks. <laughs> and uh, it's very surprising to see uh, how uh, how slow it could be and uh, even on a good computer so we uh, we have to um, make a better um, better uh, tools to uh, to to do the parameter optimization and the other one is the automated batch effect correction so there's multiple um, algorithm to do that and uh, none of them is always doing best so uh, like like combat like, like uh, there are several other uh, algorithms we tried. Some of, sometimes this one works be uh, better, sometimes that works better. So, uh, uh, and so that's, that's also another issue. How do we do, do uh, the batch effect correction automatically? Uh, the third one is uh, how do we do in a pathway um, activity from LCMS peaks? So we will introduce more on this mommy chalk, which is uh, there's a base for that. The whole idea is we cannot uh, accurately identify compounds uh, individually, but if the groups of compounds shows consistent change, the chance of have this group of compounds like in all involved in one pathway, like 20 compounds, all change consistent. And we, even there are some random errors in the individual compounds identification, but if at a group level, it's much more accurate. So just like, a, you have some random guess for one or two, but when you have a whole group and consistently in the same pathways, all change the consistent, the chance, the chance is much lower. So based on this concept, we cannot identify compounds, but it, we can be very confident about the pathway level function change. So this is uh, how we want to directly from the spectra to biology without doing accurate compound identification. So. Um, 
So um, here is uh, uh, we going to introduce the uh, uh, metabolic pre-processing tutorial. This is one uh, for the lab session in, in next uh, next section and probably tonight. And so that's why uh, <laughs> this uh, section is uh, we just developed uh, in the past month. And so there's some updates. I want to make sure you get up to date uh, slides and don't uh, um, get confused. So the overall step is you, you need to um, upload your data and select uh, doing some sanity check where the data is um, uh, satisfy the uh, requirement of the tool. Then you need to uh, select parameter. Of course, you can let the tools to do the parameter optimization and select automatically. And you submit your job and you download the result. So the key issue we are struggling with is actually after submit a job, what, what you need to wait and <laughs> that this is a uh, time consuming step, not like, not, not like a GC or, or MMR. The raw spectral process for LCMS, it really uh, takes longer, uh, much longer time. Sometimes it takes several hours. So, um, so here is that um, I just uh, show you um, um, uh, steps in this, using the screen. So you, you can see the bottom is uh, not the main server, it's a div server, a de development server. It's much more powerful. It's not released to uh, the public. So we don't want to interfere with the current uh, server, which is for everyone. But here is the, for the development server, you get a more powerful computer and the, with the spectral processing hosted. Um, and uh, so, uh, so where is this new spectral uh, hide is here. You see that the spectral analysis, and this is bottom here, and you will see one, two, three. And in your lab, you will see NMR with the basal and the GC auto fit. And this LC, uh, L, LCMS spectral of it, uh, this is one you're going to get, get, get in. So uh, to upload your spectra, and uh, this is uh, something we just updated uh, actually um, yesterday. One thing is that we realized if you really upload a huge data all in one go and uh, the internet could reset uh, so quite, sometimes it reset, sometimes not reset. So the best way to upload the large data is uh, upload your files one by one. So if if less than what, like say 100 megabytes, we in our test we will be all successful. So if you more than 200 megabytes, sometimes it will internet going to have some issues. So this is uh, one is uh, you put all your uh, spectra as a zip file, and here it shows this mzxml dot zip. So you you have your open uh, uh, for you, the spectra need to be open data format. So far as we support MZ XML, MZ data, and MZ ML. So the other ones need to be in a centroid mode. And if it's profile mode, um, so far as that not uh, support. Why is because uh, it's going to be much larger, takes much longer time. And uh, we also found a central mode in large scale process and actually doing very well. So this kind of the uh, steps uh, also uh, mainly also rec highly recommended by uh, um, the XMS, XMS online. So uh, th the thing is that if you want to upload, uh, upload your data so far as uh, convert to the open source uh, format and uh, open format and save it, convert to central mode. You can use Protein Wizard to do that. It, it is well documented. And uh, uh, how many spectra you can upload? So far, as we said about 120 spectra, which is a um, pretty uh, good number. So I guess most of you probably don't have so many uh, spectra to upload. So uh, the other ones, you need to give a metadata file. Metadata file is basically a group information about which one's QC, which one's healthy, which one's control. Uh, which one disease. So uh, it will automatically uh, doing this uh, kind of labeling. In, in the end, you get your peak intensity table, you can do statistical analysis. H here it will show you upload the job, you drop your samples to this uh, place, it will upload one by one. And uh, together with your metadata file, which uh, you can click here, there's an example and you can see how to label it. And after everything is found, you can click proceed. And uh, on the bottom, there are several uh, example files you can explore. It's about the first one during our lab. You, you are encouraged to use that first one because it's fast. You can gradually, you can directly see the result uh, without waiting two hours. So that's, that's, uh, that's the purpose. So um, you upload your data and the next one is to check 
your format is whether it's centroid or not. So far, if not centroid, it won't, won't allow you to go to the next step. So everything needs to be centroid. And what's the group label? And you can include and exclude, and you click next. And here's the main thing we have uh, tried our best to make it not over, overwhelmingly complex, but still allow you to have some control if you really want to do it manually. And so, you, uh, for example, LCMS platform, you ha we have about 12 or 15 different platform. You can use the default parameter uh, just as XMS. Uh, but on the other hand, you can choose auto-optimized. If you're doing an auto-optimized, it will uh, test in all the parameter combination and choose the best for you. And uh, this is all the parameters show you what uh, what it looks like if you want to overwrite the, the uh, 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 if you want to use default and manually specify. But if it's auto and you, you can just the uh, computer will decide for you, and you click submit a job. This one is going to take a while. And after you submit a job and uh, the next page, it will go into your job status. And here is that at the beginning it will be in a queue and the computer at the, our development server can take about uh, nine jobs simultaneously. So uh, uh, more than nine jobs, it will, you will be in a queue. So once the previous job finished and you will be bumped up there. So this is the one is because uh, it's, it's just time consuming part. So we have to control, otherwise the server will be crashed. And so if it's running, it's going to process very fast, um, at least for the example data, you can see one, two, three, it started, it will give you some text information about what's been uh, down on the back end. So it's essentially like your R terminal. So we want to give you some information because sometimes you're not sure how, what's going on. And here is basically tell you sample one is process, sample two is process, doing a peak alignment and doing a step two. So uh, try to communicate uh, with you what's going on. So you can choose to wait here. It probably takes one hour, uh, one uh, half an hour. I don't know. The server is uh, working Quite good because we we try to optimize and get things done fast. But sometimes, if you really have a large sample, and uh, it's bad, just uh, don't don't wait. So here is that you you have a see a create job URL. In this case, is you uh, you click and it will give you a link, and uh, so you can check back. Uh, so you save it to somewhere on your computer and check back uh, during night and see the result. So this is sometimes for the large jobs you don't want to wait. In the future, so we probably go to ask your email account. So we'll send an email, it's done. But uh, so far, that uh, we just uh, do it this way, uh, give you a link. We don't know who you are, so we cannot send an email. But you can always check whether it's done or not. So uh, after, like, assume after half an hour or 45 minutes, and uh, it's been done, and you, you can see the go to next, uh, proceed. And you will see some uh, summary of the PCA intensity a box plot and the baseline uh, uh, peak uh, profile. And you can see the uh, samples, how many peaks, how many missing peaks. Uh, and you see that when we do the peak alignment, we know these peaks should be there, but it's not necessarily every samples have that particular peak. We, we know it's missing. And sometimes our, our retention time also shifted a lot. And uh, so you can see there what's the difference, what's the similarity of the MZ range, and you can click individual to see it. So we're probably going to add more information here, uh, give you more inform informed output for the here. And uh, this is just a basic um, summary. And finally, if you uh, go here, you can download everything, uh, annotate the peaks and uh, filter the peaks and how what's been done. And uh, once you get this uh, peak intensity table, you can almost uh, do all the static analysis and doing the, um, like, like uh, tomorrow of Mami Chog stuff. So I guess uh, uh, this is a result table. If you want to see is uh, uh, pick sample names and uh, their uh, group label. And this is a, a large data set. Probably your T will, sh will share this with you for you to explore. So this is a group label and this uh, uh, their peaks and um, so uh, uh, this, uh, our approach, so you see that why we're doing that is uh, we really want to make sure the XMS result is, uh, we improve XMS and uh, it's, comp it's, it's, it's better than um, 
default. So here is that uh, we compare with the default on XMS online. Uh, uh, we use some, uh, we use a standard mixture. We, we know who, who, what is expected inside of the mixture, what peaks is more likely to be true. So based on that, we compare the XMS online uh, default parameter, which is, it detects about uh, 10, 16,000 peaks and uh, about 382 is two peaks. You really can see how much um, how how much noise it is, but this is a reality. So uh, so you, you people doing LCMS high resolution spec, uh, high resolution MS, you get so many features, but a lot of them is noise. So this is uh, very clear when you see this example. And uh, here is that if you use an IPO which can run about uh, one week or two, and you improve, you see a much more two peaks. But you can see the noise level also in, 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 in so also increased. And uh, uh, the other tool is uh, I called Auto Tuner, which is uh, um, very fast compared to IPO. Um, but on the other hand, the performance is not as good. Um, so it uh, it is it oh, it increased, but it's not increased not not that that good to compare to the IPO. So with Metabolist R, we use our built-in optimization. See, we, we increase the two peaks, but we didn't increase so much noise. You can see it's only slightly higher than the default, and, but the two peaks are much higher. Also, if you see the peaks identified, quantified. So how do you identify peaks, quantify peaks? We also optimize parameter. And uh, how do you see whether good or not? It's, uh, uh, and you see it's a Gaussian shape and a linear a linearity. So there's some, empirical rules, we see the peaks we pick is better and the more true peaks. So this is something I would like to show. So um, uh, David, I'm getting, getting back to you. I think that's back to a database. Okay, thanks very much, Jeff. And we'll try and um, wrap up quickly here because we're a little over time again. Um, so with NMR and GCMS, we talked about how they are good for certain classes of molecules, but LCMS is particularly good for more hydrophobic molecules than say NMR, um, but it is good for uh, obviously lipids and lipidomics, very popular. Um, it can be used for fatty acids and organic acids, um, uh, but they have to use different columns. Um, really to identify compounds, you have to use MSMS data. Uh, and if you can get some retention time, ideally you'd like to have some internal standards to help both uh, validate and semi-quantify. Um, now there are different approaches. Some groups around the world still just use high accuracy mass matching. Um, that's dubious, um, but if that's all you can get, then that's what you, you work with. Um, but the preferred way, just like with EIMS or GCMS is to do MSMS matching. Um, so if you're trying to do simple matches um, to M over Z values or molecular weight, you can go to a variety of databases. Um, there's KEBI, uh, Chemical Entities of Biological Interest. Um, it has around, I don't know, 70,000 molecules in it. PubChem, which has 70 million. ChemSpider, which has 40 million. Uh, HMDB, which has about 110,000 compounds. Uh, they all support molecular weight searches. Um, there's also um, searches that are more sophisticated where you can search by MS over MS. Um, so you can use the NIST database. Uh, the Metlin database also supports that. MassBank and Mona also support it. There's also another tool called CFMID, which we'll talk a little bit about. So when you're working with mass spec, um, as Jeff highlighted, and I've mentioned before, is that when you do ESI, you're gonna have these salt adducts, these neutral losses, uh, in-source ionization, multiply charged species. Lots of, I guess we'll call noisy peaks that need to be consolidated. Um, so as Jeff was highlighting in the example he gave, you know, 18 or 16,000 peaks, simplifying to around 700 actual compounds. Uh, you, you lose 80 to 90% of the peaks that you detect in an untargeted mass spec. Uh, so you wanna try and distinguish those addicts or multiply charged or in-source fragments from the parent uh, ions or to group the addicts uh, to become the parent ions. 
So here's an example of a mass spectrum uh, where we have sodium addicts um, and where there's this addition of you know, 22 Daltons um, to the uh, typical M plus H uh, peak. Um, so essentially there's extra peaks. Sometimes the adduct peaks are much, much more significant, much more intense than the uh, protonated peaks. And again, this just reflects the, the fact that things are ionized differently. So intensity doesn't tell you uh, concentrations. Um, so if you're deconvoluting, um, so you can see the base peak chromatogram uh, at the top, then you extract out the um, extracted ion chromatogram. And then from the extracted ion chromatogram, um, then you can see the mass spectrum. And so this can be done in two dimensions, as we're seeing here, or in three dimensions. But from the extracted ion chromatogram for this particular molecule, uh, we're seeing three clear peaks, one with a sodium adduct and one with two sodium adducts. Um, and so these all, all three peaks belong to the single peak of 525. And so we're trying to convert our multiple peaks into, those, into that single peak of 525.08. There are a variety of tables where people have generated the types of addicts that you'll often see, depending on uh, the solvent, the salts, uh, and the behavior of the, of the molecule. So you can see that you can get more than just a sodium addict. Uh, if you're working in solvents where there's ammonia or uh, formic acid, if there's potassium or sodium or chloride, Again, whether you're in your positive or negative mode, you can get double ionization. That's where you see two Ms. Um, and you can see the potassium, you can see the removal of hydrogen, the addition of hydrogen, the addition of methanol. Uh, there's lithium. Um, so all these adducts are possible for the same molecule. So you know, take one molecule and it looks like there's around 30 possible peaks. So this is the scaling that you can potentially see in a, in a, in a given um, uh, untargeted study. Oliver Fien, um, who works at UC Davis, and probably many of you have heard of him, um, has a tool called the Addict Table, an Addict Calculator. Uh, and this is listing even more addicts that include even acetonitrile as well as methanol with isopropanol, DMSO, uh, along with ammonia, sodium, potassium uh, addicts. And these are just for the positive ion mode. In the negative ion mode, there'd be others. And then there's this multiple charges, um, two Ms being doubly charged molecules. Um, so again, just to emphasize the complications that you see with LCMS. There's also the process of, of, of neutral losses where things are fragmented. Um, and so in, depending on where things are cut or broken, uh, you'll see molecules that are detectable. Uh, so we can see the parent, nominal parent ions, 122, but we don't um, see say the 45 Dalton one or the 17 Dalton one because these are neutral losses. Instead, we just see the 77 and the 105, which are the charged components. Um, so, a number of databases um, actually are designed to handle uh, and predict adducts um, and to predict things like ion pairs or multiply charged species. Um, so METLIN can handle um, multiple ion species and neutral loss species. Um, and, and because of this issue of so many extra masses, purely searching by only the mass to charge ratio that you think you're seeing can generate a lot of false positives. So as Jeff highlighted, and as you saw with some examples with metaboanalyst R, and as we gave you a few other examples, the process of, 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 of handling or pre-processing LCMS data involves removing and consolidating adducts, um, consolidating multiply charged species, species, removing or identifying fragments, the neutral losses, the breakdown products, any rearrangements, removing or consolidating isotope peaks. Also, there's a process of removing noise peaks. So from using sample blanks, um, when you put in things like technical replicates or quality controls, 
or some people will test and dilute samples and it will show dilution trends. And if you don't see the dilution effect, uh, then you can also assume that's also noise. So these are tricks or processes that, that all have to be done when you're working with untargeted LCMS runs to, to reduce those 18,000 features or 15,000 features down to a countable number. So this is a, a typical process um, where you can use tools like MZMine, Metfusion, Tableau MS R, um, XCMS. If you had just a single positive mode spectrum, getting 15 to 20,000 features is not unusual. If you remove the addicts or merge the addicts, that'll knock it down by about 20%. If you consolidate the multiple charges, that'll reduce it by another 20%. If you remove the neutral losses, that'll would consolidate them. That'll knock it down by another 20%. If you handle the isotope peaks properly, that'll cut it by more than half. And then if you remove noise peaks, that'll knock things down by another 15 to 20%. So for a typical positive ion spectrum, you might end up with some 15 or 16,000 features down to perhaps 2,500 actual peaks for positive mode. And generally for negative mode, uh, you, it's not quite as sensitive, so you'll typically see about half that number. So you saw those examples with uh, Jeff talking about the specific example of the defined mixture where they went from you know, 18,000 to 700 identified compounds. Um, those compounds also probably would have included additional peaks. Um, so this is, this, this is the level of filtering you typically have to do. Now, you don't, I mean, at this stage, you have a lot of uh, mass to charge ratios and some peaks. And depending on the type of mass, mass spectrometer, if you're using Orbi traps, TOFs, QTOFs, uh, you can get um, enough information to make a stab at what a level three identification. You can try and convert the mass or mass to charge to uh, a formula. And a formula is a class of compounds. Uh, it, it can, you can look it up on in databases and you can say it's got to be one of these 20 compounds. Um, so you need uh, the accurate monoisotopic mass and you need to have some kind of estimate of the error. So the database, uh, I should have checked, but at least last year it was working. This year should still be too. Uh, it's maintained in Wales uh, at the University of Aberystwyth. Uh, and it generates a, a nice molecular formula. And you can, it's a simple server. You can type in the accurate mass, the tolerance. Um, you can apply what's called the seven golden rules, something about my Oliver Fiennes group and the type of composition that you think the compound should have. And it'll generate a formula. Um, you can also um, search once you've got the molecular formulas, go off to large databases like PubChem or ChemSpider and identify the actual compounds that match those formulas. So from a mass alone, you might have 100 possible molecules. If you've got a molecular formula, that may shrink it down to on the order of 30 possible molecules. And then if you go to a database, that might shrink that M over Z value down to maybe 10 possible molecules. So from mass to charge to formula, to something that's in a known database, it sort of reduces the total possibilities down. Now you can even clean it up a little further because there are some formula filters that are designed to um, use information about uh, atom types and the bond valency and uh, rules about atomic composition and bonding restrictions. And those are built in to actually help reduce um, both false positives, but to make more realistic molecular formulas. And so this is what's called the seven golden rules. And these have been around for about six or seven years, maybe longer now, that Oliver Fiennes group developed. And so they can take um, you know, accurate mass along with the isotopomers that you see, you know, those extra three or four small peaks that are associated in your extracted ion chromatogram. Now these are not the adducts, so these are ones that differ by one Dalton. And the intensity of those is very important. But if you have that information about those isotopomers, you can put it into tools like the uh, Aberystwyth machine or all our beans, golden rules, or some of the commercial software, and they will generate a, a pretty 
good guess of what the formula should be. So there is more information in the molecular formula than in the mass. So if you apply the molecular formula filter, and this is an example of a Brooker one, here it's generating um, possible formulas and possible matches. And in this case, uh, this one that's C24H15F3N5O4P is likely your best match. And so with that formula, you can now go and search uh, against um, databases like ChemSpider or HMDB or whatever. Now you can see that the mass alone had at least seven or eight possible mass matches at 525.0808. But the formula filter zeroes it down to just one formula. And that one formula probably matches to a half dozen compounds. Whereas if you just use the mass alone, you might get 30 or 40 matches. So this is the advantage of using formula filters to help narrow down your search. And this is a, a graph that was illustrated that when you're using formulas, obviously you can narrow it down using standard chemical rules and the seven golden rules. So you, you know, start off with 8 billion possible elemental compositions. Seven golden rules shrinks it down to 600 million. Um, the formulas, if you search um, through PubChem, you're working at, you know, in this kind, this is back when PubChem only had 10 million compounds. But then you can also search more tightly and say, well, look, I know that I'm only looking at, at this class of compounds from this known organism. And if you can narrow that down, then in some cases, the formula alone will give you an, a unique hit. This is some statistics about just the frequency of formulas. And so as you go up into larger and larger molecules, the number of possible matches or isomers uh, molecular weight isomers increases linearly. So something with a molecular weight of 200 Daltons or an M over Z value of 200 Daltons will have somewhere on the order of 20 to 25 um, possible molecular formulas or possible compounds. And the number of formulas increases as you go up with molecular weight. But applying these uh, seven golden rules and other filters saying, I know my I'm looking at natural products, so there shouldn't be any fluorine or I know that I'm looking at uh, a compound that um, is only produced um, with carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen because there's no sulfur in the system, then that allows you to limit um, the search quite a bit and narrow things down. This also shows you how having very accurate masses also helps things. So if you don't have isotopic information, um, you have to very much depend on um, having really accurate mass. So this is Orbitrap uh, FTMS type data. So if you're able to measure this accurately for smaller molecular weight compounds, you can pretty much get um, the right formula. Uh, if you have larger molecular weight compounds, then you need higher accuracy to get uh, fewer formulas. And this is without using isotopes. But if you have the isotope um, information, and if you're able to measure those accurately, then you get even further narrowing or further reduction in terms of um, the uh, number of formats. So even if you had a mass spec that only had three ppm, but you included the uh, isotopic abundancy, you could go from a thousand possible formulas down to 18. So high resolution mass combined with isotopic information, combined with these filtering rules, like the seven golden rules, can get you um, to identifying, in some cases, a completely unique molecule. Now, it's not a confirmation because you don't have the authentic standard, and it's still based purely on a formula, which is more computational, so you could be wrong. And this is just, again, highlighting how the use of, of looking at isotopic abundance uh, allows you to at least determine in this case, the correct more formula for this rather complicated molecule. So this is a real case where they used, uh, looked at solanine and were able to get sufficient mass accuracy, sufficient isotopic abundance to get an absolute confirmation of the formula, which then allowed them to determine that this had to be the compound, which then they confirmed with an authentic standard. Now, a real problem is that, that a lot of the databases like PubChem, Kebi, and even Metlin and the NIST database mix non-metabolites with metabolites, or you know, they'll put in 
you know, exotic uh, explosive compounds in the NIST database. They're, they're very common there. PubChem has a lot of essentially theoretical compounds that are created in chemical screening libraries. Um, these are things that have never left the lab or never will be found in a plant or a duck or a bird or, or in humans. Um, and others include purely buffer compounds, um, you know, tris and, and trisma base. These are things that are not really useful. And this is leading to examples, which I'll highlight again, where people are finding, you know, exotic um, drugs like cocaine in rats. Um, it's because simply they're getting a mass match and that just is, it's not possible. Um, so if you know something about the organism and the source organism that can greatly limit the, the size and the number of, of compounds that you're, you're matching and that, that can make a real difference uh, when you're doing formula matching. And we'll talk about some of these organism specific or application specific databases. Um, I mentioned before that, that quantitation in LCMS is not frequently done, um, and most untargeted techniques have no real solid indication of, 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 of quantitation. There's some relative measure, um, but it, it is not absolutely quantitative. Even if you knew exactly how much you added to your sample uh, as your reference or quality control, it still is not going to give you absolute quantitation. To do absolute quantitation, you have to have spiked edition of isotopic standards. Those are expensive. You also have to make sure that those isotopic standards are the same type, same chemical, or very, very nearly the same. And typically to do quantitation by mass spec, you have to do it with um, more often with triple quad instruments. You can do it in QTOF and Orbi traps as well, but you go into something similar to an SRM, single reaction monitoring or multiple reaction monitoring mode. Multiple reaction monitoring or single reaction monitoring uh, involves the use of these isotopic standards. Um, it looks at um, identifying a specific precursor ion and a specific product ion. So you have to have fragmentation. You have to have uh, something that you can say, I'm looking at this parent ion, 121, and I'm looking for these product ions. And so here's a list of uh, parent ions and product ions. And those parent ions and product ions have to be unique uh, or the pair of them has to be unique. Um, and so when you're doing quantification, you've got to make sure that those are identifiable. Um, they uniquely confirm the molecule. And then the intensity of those peaks based on the isotopic standards is used to quantify things. So although our focus has been mostly on untargeted metabolomics, there are targeted techniques. A number of labs and a number of companies have started creating targeted metabolomic kits. Biocrates is one of the first, it's based in Austria and they've had the P180, the P400, the P500 kits. Um, Shimadzu has kits. Um, there are other groups that are also producing the advantage of targeted quantitative metabolomics is that it is incredibly fast. So we talk about weeks of processing time for untargeted metabolomics data just for the computer. Um, with targeted metabolomics, it's often possible to process 80 samples in 24 hours, both sort of the data collection, data processing, absolute quantification, and full identification. Um, it's semi-automatic, but it's approaching automatic. So again, just like you know, GCMS with GC AutoFit, Basil, and the targeted kits uh, like these, you can really fly through a lot of samples and get a lot of quantitative information very quickly. This is an example of the concentration ranges that you can measure. So with the kit systems, you can go down to 10 nanomole or, or lower and to as high concentrations of seven to 10 millimolar. So essentially a million full concentration range is detectable and quantifiable in uh, these targeted MS-based systems. So it's quite impressive. And as I say, this is, if you want to do high throughput metabolomics um, with um, either trending towards automation or semi-automation, um, these are the way to do it or a way to go. We're gonna take a break now. We're, but, 
for those of you who are going to be involved in the lab, uh, we want to make sure that you can download these uh, data files because this is what you're going to need for the for the lab. Uh, 